Welcome back students. In our previous video, I covered how the de Bruyne equation allowed us to consider both the wave nature of a, an electron or a particle, such as an electron, and its particle nature uh, because it has mass and velocity. So the de Bruyne equation allows us to consider the wave particle duality of subatomic particles and we then were able to use that equation to calculate the wavelength of a particle. In that case the the particle was a baseball and as I mentioned for macroscopic large enough particles that you can see them the de Bruyne equation gives us a wavelength, a de Bruyne wavelength that is very 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 small and so it's so infinitesimally small that it's negligible. We can, we can ignore it. It's not meaningful. But when we start talking about electrons and protons, because they are so small, their masses down here in the denominator are so small for electrons and protons that you can see that mathematically a very small number in this denominator is going to make the wavelength larger. And so the wavelength for a, an electron starts to become significant. It becomes about the size of 1 times 10 to the minus 10th meters. And at that point, you're getting about the size of an atom itself. And so when we're dealing with electrons and protons, their de Broglie wavelengths are significant. So we're going to be considering the significance of that. That electrons, for example, can be thought of as particles and they can be thought of as waves. And that's going to lead us into the next section. So you may recall that I showed you that there are two different ways to think about these wavelengths, depending on if we were talking about electromagnetic radiation, like a photon, or if we were talking about a particle with mass, such as a proton or electron. Two different ways of calculating wavelengths. Well, now that leads us into what I'd like to focus on for this video. And that is uh, the further development of quantum theory to describe the behavior of electrons specifically. So the rest of this treatment is going to be talking about the quantum theory and the quantum mechanics of electrons. Well, before we fill in that gap, I've got to give you some background. One of the challenges of dealing with the wave-particle duality of an electron is that on the quantum level, if you can consider a particle as being a wave, then it's hard to know exactly where that wave is at any given moment in time. If you have a wave, let's just take a wave here for example. So we've got a wave. And you're asked, okay, where is the electron? Well, is it over here? Is it here? Is it here? Is it over here? We don't know exactly where that electron is because we're no longer considering the electron as a particle that has a specific defined position in space. If an electron can be thought of as a wave, then you might think of the electron as being smeared out or spread out over this whole region of space. Well, if you think of an electron that way, then it becomes very difficult to talk about where an electron is exactly in a given moment and where exactly it is traveling and how fast exactly it is doing so. So one of the early researchers in quantum mechanics, his name was Heisenberg, And if you've watched the TV show Breaking Bad, this is the Heisenberg that uh, Walter White in that show uh, chose his name from. So this researcher, Heisenberg, was studying the quantum mechanical nature of electrons. And he came up with a mathematical equation that showed that the more certainty you have in knowing exactly where the electron is in a particular moment, the less certainty that you have in knowing its momentum, that is, its mass and velocity. 
so that there was fundamentally an inverse relationship in the certainty of those two things, in knowing the location of the electron and knowing its momentum, its mass times velocity. And so he came up with what's called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. And the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle says that since particles also behave as waves, the uncertainty in the location of a particle, such as an electron, is inversely proportional to the uncertainty of its momentum. So at the more that you know one, the less you know of the other. And the more that you know about the other, the less that you know about the first one, its location. Well, this makes it kind of difficult to talk about exactly where an ele electrons are in an atom you know, and how fast they're traveling, which direction they're going, and so forth, at a specific moment in time. So that's the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. So another researcher cam comes along, and his name is Schrödinger, Erwin Schrödinger, S-C-H-R-O, with an umlaut over the O, so he pronounced it Schrödinger. So Schrödinger comes up with a very important mathematical equation, which we now call the Schrödinger equation. And the Schrödinger equation considers the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and it considers the wave nature of an electron, and it takes care of some of this problem, I should say, for us, in being able to determine approximately where an electron is going to be. Now, the Schrodinger equation is some fairly complex math, and we're not going to get into the complex math. But I do want you to know what it's called. It's the Schrodinger equation. And the Schrodinger equation relates the energy states of electrons, and we've talked about those before, the n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and so forth. Those are the quantized energy states of electrons. To their probable positions, where you might find them, their probable locations in three-dimensional space. And there was another fellow named Max Born who took the Schrodinger equation and basically squared it. And when you take the square of the wave function, so there's the wave function, if you take the square of the wave function, then you end up getting the region of a probable location where an electron might be, also called orbitals. So an electron's orbital is a region in space, a three-dimensional region in which you will probably find the electron. So orbitals have different shapes and sizes depending on their energy levels. So n equals 1, n equals 2, they have different shapes and sizes. And remember, when we're talking about these orbitals, they are a three-dimensional region of space where an electron might be found. And when you plot the graphs of the square of these wave functions, you get these three-dimensional graphic plots. And these three-dimensional graphic plots are the orbitals for electrons. It may be a little bit difficult to see this letter here. This is an S, and then PX, PZ, PY. These are D orbitals, and these are F orbitals. So, this is an S orbital. These are P orbitals. These are d orbitals. And these are f orbitals. OK. So again, just to recap, the Schrodinger equation allows us to calculate a wave function which is basically a mathematical function that describes the wave, the standing wave that an electron forms 
And if you take the square of the wave function, you get a three-dimensional graph, which is the orbital, which gives us the three-dimensional region of space where you might find an electron located. We also call this a probability distribution. So it's a probability distribution. It's a distribution of the electron's probability of being located here. So these are probability distributions. Where the probability of finding an electron around an atom is given by this three-dimensional graph. So I mentioned that there are s orbitals, there are p orbitals, there are d orbitals, and there are f orbitals. And I want to note that s orbitals, there's one s orbital and it is uh, shaped like a sphere. All right. There are p orbitals and notice that a p orbital has two lobes and so you can think of these as kind of like dumbbells, okay? So we say that p orbitals are shaped like dumbbells. So s orbitals are spherical, p orbitals are dumbbell shaped, and then we get into d and f orbitals and their shapes can be quite complex. We start to look like uh, there are four lobes like a clover there, that looks like a dumbbell with two lobes and then a donut around the middle of it. Very odd. And then some of these F orbitals that are so complex, they look like balloon animals that some clown would make at a party. But again, these are three-dimensional graphs of a three-dimensional region of space that provides the probability of finding an electron somewhere in all of this space that is defined by that wave function. Okay, before we move on and we start talking about orbitals and S, P, D, and so forth, there are numbers that are implied by the Schrodinger equation. And we're going to get into talking about those numbers. They are called quantum numbers, and that's going to be in the next video. And once we talk about quantum numbers, then we're going to start talking about these orbitals and how electrons start to populate them. And that's called electron configurations and electron diagrams. So that's coming up in the next couple of videos. However, before we get there, I'm going to link to another video at the end of this one, and I do want you to watch it. It's only about seven minutes long, and it will give you a little bit more background and context into this. It's a very good video, and I do want you to watch it. So I will link it at the, at the end of this video.